So thinking about Valentine's Day, I was trying to think of every year uh, when it's a holiday or when there's an elephant in the room kind of deal, I try to think to speak to that occasion, right? Last year I spoke on love. On Christmas, I spoke on Christmas. You know, you try to, you know, go with the theme. So today I thought about it, about Valentine's Day and what could I talk about that would best suit the romantic heart that's in each of us. You know, this is the time of year where the men are working overtime, trying to think of the ways to impress their significant other, their brides. We're, we're going through, we're counting our, our beans, making sure we got enough money to buy that chocolate and to take them out and to, you know, to treat them well. So I don't know if you've been struggling with that, but that's, that's the time of year we're in. Is that So what could I speak on that would address the romantic in you? And so here's the best that I came up with, math. Okay? How many of you love math? How many of you just have a romance going with math? Most of us don't. Roger does. (laughs) Most of us fear math. There's nothing romantic about it. It's like the furthest thing away from being romantic, math is, isn't it? Man, I never was one for it. And, and maybe they should have an appreciation class for math every year just to get you motivated to have to get in there and start doing those formulas and solving those problems. It's just one of those things. A lot of us get anxious. In fact, some of you might even be getting stressed right now thinking about those tests that you used to have to take it and just, you know struggling over math and those formulas. The great G.K. Chesterton said this about math, the difference between the poet and the mathematician is that the poet tries to get his head into the heavens while the mathematician tries to get the heavens into his head. And math is a daunting thing. Math is difficult. And yet the whole universe, the description of it can be found in math. This building we could describe in mathematical terms, couldn't we? We could describe you in mathematical terms. How tall you are, the shape of you, the weight of you. All those things can be described in mathematical terms. But most of us don't like it. The only math that most of us like is if we're counting money. And a lot of times, if we're counting money, we're probably counting debits as opposed to credits. But there are some difficult math equations out there. Einstein said this, don't worry about your difficulties in mathematics. I can assure you, mine are greater. Can you think about the problems that Einstein was dealing with in math? Probably makes what we're wrestling with in our algebra or geometry or adding and subtracting look kind of minor league, huh? His problems in math were... Some math problems take years to solve. In fact, there was this guy by the name of Pierre de Fermat who scribbled a theorem in his math book. And it was an equation. It was, if n is an integer greater than 2 then the equation x to the nth power plus y to the nth power equals z to the nth power has no positive integral solutions. That took 350 years to solve. Wow. And I'm still trying to figure out what it even means. In fact, right now, if you're good at math, you can make a million dollars by solving Six different equations that are unsolvable. In fact, the Clay Mathematics Institute offers the Millennium Prize problems $1 million if you can solve any of six problems. So if you're good at math and you want to make some money, $1 million to solve one math problem. And if you're really good, you can make $6 million by solving six. Does that motivate anybody? 
All right, Roger might be con- he might be a millionaire by the end of the. We'll even let you uh, start working on it now. But math. But what I have found that in the New Testament there is a math problem that is the most difficult. There is a formula that has yet to be solved in in many cases, in many people's lives. There is a formula, there is a math problem that is difficult to solve. And it comes from Jesus Himself. And it's found in Matthew chapter 18. I want you to look there with me. Matthew chapter 18 and hear this math problem that Jesus gives His disciples. And it's still a problem. It's still something that we all have to work on. Matthew 18, 21 and following. Then Peter came to Him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. There it is. How often should I forgive somebody? And Peter wanted to quantify it. And there may be something in you that wants to quantify that because you know what? Someone has sinned against you so many times has hurt you, has trespassed against you. And and Peter says, well, Lord, if they do it past seven times, can we just call it off? And Jesus gives the hardest math problem ever. No, Peter. It's It's not seven times. It's seven times 70. And the point that Jesus is making is you can't quantify forgiveness. You can't put a number on it. Anybody know what 7 times 70 is? 490. But the point that Jesus is making is that forgiveness, you can't quantify it. You can't. And so today I wanted to give you a lesson about forgiveness because I believe that forgiveness, the subject of forgiveness, is probably... One of the most important lessons you can learn in marriage, in romance, and really in any relationship that you deal with. Forgiveness is a skill that we all need to know. But how do we get that formula working in our lives? How do we work out that math problem in our lives? Because it's not easy. And the reason why this problem is so hard is because it's not a problem that is from the mind. It's a problem of the heart, isn't it? Because it's hard to forgive people. Because some people know how to hurt you so deeply, and they have said things, done things, and hurt you so deeply. And you don't want to forgive them. There's some people right now that you don't want to forgive, and there's people that I struggle to forgive. The first thing that we have to get right about the equation is the first thing is the confrontation. And Matthew deals with that in Matthew 18. And this gives us the instructions that's to happen in the church, but I think it gives us good principles to apply in our everyday lives. Here's what you do in the church if someone sins against you. Verse 15, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Ooh. That's usually the last thing that we do. Because usually when we have a fault with someone, we tell everybody else, including their mother. And then we get around to talking to them after it's blown up into something even worse. But Jesus says, if you have someone who sins against them, first go to them alone. And if he hears you, you have gained a brother. But if he will not hear you, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses to hear it uh, from the church, let him be to you as a heathen and tax collector. So this is the way that you solve problems in the church. You go to them privately. You bring two or three witnesses. And then you take it to the church. Well, how do we handle confrontation in our lives? Everyday confrontation. 
Those principles apply, don't they? They're good principles, like going to that person alone. So I've got ten commandments of how to confront somebody. Number one, thou shalt confront others in private. That's the first thing that we've talked about. Go to them in private. Give them the courtesy of being able to address it in a private way. Go to them. Don't tell everybody. Don't go on a campaign against their character when you haven't even talked to them first. Go to them in private. Number two, thou shalt confront as soon as possible and not look for a better time. How many times do we let something fester inside of us? We get get mad at someone, we have aught with someone, and then we just let it live inside of us for a long time. And then finally... We blow up against them. We say, they say something, and then we just let them have it. Number three, thou shalt stick to the issue at hand. Boy, that's difficult, isn't it? Stick to the issue at hand. Talk about the issue that you have with them. How many times do we begin with the issue, and then it branches out? And then we just start throwing everything in there. Number four, thou shalt make thy point and not repeat it. Mm, that's tough. Because I like repeating my point. I like letting them have it. Going over and over and over and really giving it to them, right? Number five. Thou shalt deal only with actions that can be changed. How many of us can talk about the past and the past and the past and yet that is beyond our power, isn't it? I can't go back into the past and change it. Thou shalt... Deal with actions that you can change, things that you can do. Thou shalt avoid sarcasm, especially in email or text. Because a lot of times that sarcasm doesn't cross over correctly, does it? It's not as funny to the person we're texting that it is to us. Thou shalt avoid words like always and never because they are rarely accurate. But yet we like to throw them into those discussions. You're always something. And you never do this. And that's rarely true. Thou shalt ask questions and offer suggestions. (coughs) Ask some questions. Number nine, thou shalt not apologize for the confrontation. Confrontation, conflict is a matter of life. It will happen no matter how great you are, no matter how great your marriage is, no matter how great of a neighbor you are. Sometimes there's going to be conflict. And there's no reason to have to apologize for it. We're adults. And number ten, thou shalt remember to highlight the person's positive contributions. And that might be the thing that you want to start out with. This is how you bless my life. This is what kind of a friend you are. This is what kind of a wife, a husband you are to me. I love you. Start out with the positive. We have to get the confrontation right first in the equation, don't we? Or things can go drastically wrong. Those ten commandments are from John Maxwell. Number two, the kingdom of God is about forgiveness. That if you want to know what the kingdom of God is about, it is about forgiveness. And Jesus then gives us this parable, this story about forgiveness. And there's two guys, there's two debtors, there's two guys that owe people. And the first one owes 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents. And and he's a servant. and And the king requests him to pay it and he can't pay it. He can't pay the 10,000 talents and he begs for forgiveness. And the king forgives him. But then what does that servant go and do? Why, he goes and finds someone that owes him money, a hundred denarii, and requires that of him immediately. It says that he takes him by the throat and demands the hundred denarii. Meanwhile, he's just been forgiven how much? 10,000 talents. How much is 10,000 talents? 10,000 talents is an obscene amount of money. 
In fact, Josephus talks about the whole region of Judea and Samaria paying taxes to Rome. And guess how much it was? 600 talents. For a whole region of people paying taxes to the Roman government. So how much is 10,000 talents? Well, first let's talk about the denarii. Denarii was a day's wage that denarius was. So if we're talking minimum wage, we're talking $7.25 an hour, $58. This is what the first servant owed. $58 times 100. That's how much he owed. Now how much is one talent? Listen to this. One talent is equal to 6,000 denarii. One talent. In fact, one talent is 20 years of daily wages. Six days a week, and if you give them the Sabbath, that's 20 years. One talent equals $348,000. Now, remember, how much does this guy owe again? How much does he owe? 10,000 talents. Oh, we're back to math, aren't we? Oh, you thought I was done with that. When you put it all together, it's 60 million working days, 200,000 years of labor, $3.48 billion. He owed a debt that he could not pay. And he was forgiven it. And yet to his fellow laborer who owed him money, a hundred denarii, he couldn't find within himself the grace within himself to forgive. Now who are we in the story? Who are you in that story? We are the ones who have been forgiven an infinite amount. We have been forgiven $3.48 billion in sin. We've sinned against an eternal God. We owe an eternal debt. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Now how am I supposed to treat those who sin against me? I need to forgive them. What about my wife? What about your husband? What about your children? What about your father? What about those people that have sinned against you? Forgive them. Because God has forgiven you. Think about God's forgiveness. He forgives us freely. He forgives you freely. For by grace are you saved through grace. That not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Jesus paid that debt for you and I. It is the free gift of God. Salvation is. It's free. He forgives us fully. He's not hanging on to a little bit of it. There's no shadow debt to God. In fact, He forgives everything as far as the east is from the west. I have removed your transgression from you. That's how far your sin is away from you when God forgives you. He forgives you forever. (coughs) Forever and ever. And He also is faithful in that forgiveness. Let me tell you something. That we will never more resemble God than when we forgive someone. That you will resemble God the most and resemble Christ the most, not when you're sitting up in church on good behavior, but when you forgive somebody. Because it's so difficult, isn't it? Think about this. We are our relationships. And over and over again in the Bible, the Bible addresses relationships. Our relationship with God, our relationship with our neighbor, our relationship with our family. Over and over again, it says we're our relationships. That's what mattered to us. And in the end, when we look back over the course of our life, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about relationships because they matter so much. There's three Vital words, aren't they? Three important words that we yearn for. Especially on Valentine's Day. 
We want to hear those three words, right? I love you. We want to feel loved. Our children want to be loved. How many times have you ever asked me, hey, do you love me? You still love me? We want to hear it. But there's also three words that transfer to that. And it's I forgive you. It also tells us in the Bible that forgiveness has a contingent nature. What does that mean? That God forgives us how? How we forgive others. Forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. If I'm not forgiving, then will God be forgiving to me? There's a contingency there. And also, forgiveness is ultimately freedom. Freedom within yourself. Freedom from sin. Freedom from that evil that's within inside of you. You know, we talk about extraordinary forgiveness. I don't know if you've ever been called to forgive somebody, but you know, this week I started thinking about what I would preach on Valentine's Day, and I was like, what would be a good Valentine's sermon? And forgiveness came to my mind. And I thought, well, I can do that. But then lo and behold, something happens within my week to where I actually have to do it. Thanks, God, for making me have to forgive somebody this week when I didn't want to. But there's been such magnanimous great feats of forgiveness. You know, a couple years ago, a young man, 21 years old, walks into a church in Charleston, South Carolina on a Wednesday night. And he didn't come there for Bible study. He came in with a gun and started shooting people who were studying God's Word. And then, later on, he has to see those people in the courtroom, the family members that he's killed, the family members that lost their loved ones, and guess what? He doesn't even look at them. Doesn't even lift his eyes to see who he has killed. The family members, they're weeping in total loss. He doesn't even lift his eyes to look at what he's taken away. And yet, Nadine Collier, a woman that lost her mother of 70 years, had the courage to say this, I forgive you. You took something very precious from me. I will never talk to her again. I will never ever hold her again. But I forgive you and have mercy on your soul. When we talk about Christianity, there was no greater moment of clarity of what Christianity is than that woman having the courage to tell that cold-blooded murderer something he didn't deserve to hear. I forgive you. But it ultimately was freedom from the evil that was inside of her, wasn't it? One person once said, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that prisoner was you. So today I know that there's someone who needs either A, forgiveness, or needs to give forgiveness. Why not do that today? Life's too long for us to hold those grudges and that poison within us that really just poisons our own life, destroys our own life, destroys our belief in other people. Why not forgive them? Not because they deserve it. Not because they're asking for it. Not because they're coming to you and, and, and telling you all the things. That, no, but because you deserve it. You deserve to forgive those people. And think of what God has forgiven us. And He's faithful. If we will confess our sins, He will forgive us. 
That's the most transformative thing in the world is forgiveness. And if you've ever been forgiven, then you're ready to forgive somebody else. Let's pray together and release that sin in our hearts. Lord, You have forgiven us of so much. Lord, help us to come to You honestly and with open hearts and to, and to show You who we are. And Lord, I pray for each person here that if there's hurt and woundedness and relationships that have been harmed, that You would help us to do the unthinkable, to do what You have done for us, to forgive, to let it go, not because anyone deserves it, but because we deserve it through Your grace, through what Christ has done for us. Lord, help us to be humble. Help us to have healthy boundaries. Help us to protect our families and who we are. But Lord, also help us to be forgiving. Thank You for Your grace, mercy, and love. And it's through Christ Jesus, Your Son, we pray. Amen. Have you obeyed the Gospel of Christ? The Bible says that if you want to begin to follow Jesus Christ, you have to begin with faith. That without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is a reward. To believe in who Jesus is. To repent of those sins that we did. To confess Christ to be the Son of the living God. And to be baptized, immersed into His body, the church. And we begin to walk that walk of discipleship with Jesus. That means forgiving people. That means telling them the good news. That means uh, assembling and gathering together. It means giving. Or maybe you are a Christian and you've let that light diminish within you and you need prayers of healing. If you have any need, won't you come now as together we stand and as we sing.